It's very, very correct. Because if the same up to a point, not totally, happening today, I think you already mentioned here a text in New Left Review by T.J. Clark, who says, you know that, one would have thought, uh, okay, that's the line, I'm sorry if I repeat myself, that uh, officially, uh, what was the politic, political attitude of radical left in this crisis? It was, we live in apparently good times, but there will be a crisis, it will be our moment, and so on, you know, to play this dark prophet. Okay, now there is a crisis, and we have, we had... Uh, rebellions, demonstrations, crises, and it's basically, let's be honest, this last crisis, the big winner is the left. I mean, they simply didn't provide an alternative, no? And this is why, and people hate me. I had problems with Badiou here. I had problems with my leftist friends, even in Greece and so on. When they consider me a traitor, like once they shouted at me as saboteur, traitor. When I asked them, all I did is I asked them a simple question. What do you want? That is to say, okay, you have this protest movement, but what do you want? Take power, just be a civil society group putting pressure. If you take power, what? Some kind of a more Keynesian more welfare state, like, what do you want? And for them this was sabotage, like, you don't, you don't talk about it, you know. Because uh, 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 I still think that the left doesn't have a, an, I, you know what, which is, I have it, I think, even in this last big fat book of mine, this problem where I like to provoke people and you know who is, okay, let me test your general education. Who is the greatest American writer of the 20th century? Think Evil. Ayn Rand, you know her. <laughs> Some, you know? Okay, okay, I mean, we make fun of her, but first, I think uh, that she is interesting. You know why? I often use this category of over-orthodoxy. This idea was given to me by, you don't know who he was, he's forgotten today, Lucien Goldman, a great... Hegelian, Western-oriented Marxist pupil of Lukács, who was doing his work mostly in France in the 50s. And he wrote a wonderful book <coughs> in 56-7, I think, Le Dieu Caché, The Hidden God, about uh, uh, Pascal and this Jansenism. You know, they are, if you ask me one or theological orientation, which is closest to me, it would be Jansenism. You know why? They are, this is just one of the things, they are the only Catholics, <coughs> Jansenists, they are the only Catholics who advocate predestination. You know, usually Catholicism is, uh, you have to earn your redemption through your good work, no? And uh, Protestants, everything is predestined. But here things get interesting. Okay, I'm sorry if I repeat myself, but you know, it's, this is why, as my friend Fred Jameson told me once, he even wrote about it, it he, you, here, when you have pearls like this, you can see that the guy really is a theoretician, you know, knows. Once he was asked, Fred Jameson, which element of theology, which notion is most useful to historical materialism, to Marxism. And everyone expected some humanist stupidity, like, you know, like, just believe in progress, free will. No, he said predestination. The predestination is, uh, uh, why? Because first, did you notice this wonderful paradox? I repeat it all the time. How, as we all know, up to a point it's even true from Max Weber, uh, uh, radical Calvinist Protestantism is, was, the religious foundation ideology, however you put it, of capitalism. Okay, but are you aware how, prima facie, from a common sense view, how weird this is? Because capitalism is definitely the most dynamic social economic system, like it pushes you to work all the time. 
So common sense will tell you, wait a minute, why, sh why then Calvinist Protestantism? I mean, if everything is predestined, let me sit at home, masturbate and watch movies, you know, it's like, who cares, it's already decided. Isn't it logical to claim that precisely if it depends on me, this would put a um, permanent pressure on me? No, the, because you know what's the point, no? You can have wonderful, very Lacanian observations about we are back to that problem of retroactivity and so on. Everything is decided, but you don't know how, you know. Like, you just have to give a little bit of a shift into you retroactively create your choice. And uh, I forgot his name, it's not, I think it's Plantinga. I forgot his name, you know, it's a great American Calvinist theologist. He's the he's very interesting guy, very intelligent, and he is almost kind of a analytical philosophy theologist because he is very well versed in all those Davidson problems and so on. And he tried to find a solution to this freedom of how to unite predestination and freedom of choice. But I think it's not radical enough. But it is intelligent, admit it. His solution is this one. There is predestination, but nonetheless, when you act now, here, you choose freely. How? Ah. How then, if you choose now freely, what right and you, to be sinner or not, how then could God have decided at the very beginning, no, predestined your salvation or not? It's a very primitive solution, but it's logical. It's, his, his solution is simply to say, no, now you are totally free. But God is omnipotent and knows everything, and he knows in advance how you will freely decide now. You know, it's okay. too easy. But what I'm saying is that, okay, let's not go into this. Something else. What is, uh, you know what is the, the, the Marxist or Hegelian solution of predestination? That it's, okay, again, uh, old guy like me, I talk about things that I cannot do, my obsessions with sex, love and so on. You know, when you fall in love, you have this magical feeling, even if it's purely contingent, like let's imagine a stupid thing. You walk towards a job, you sleep, this proverbial stupidity, you sleep on a banana peel, on a banana, you are taken to, a, to, a, to, a, to emergency and there the doctor is a uh, nice woman and you fall passionately in love with her. So it's pure stupid contingency. But nonetheless, isn't it that automatically, once you fall in love, all the past is restructured, you experience it as if all my life was the preparation for that moment, you know. Along this lines, one should do it. And maybe, these are I think parts which are not totally bad, that I quote in my uh, book, uh, this is the materialist reading of uh, Here, Hegel is a good Jansenist, or rather Protestant. You know, because uh, let's take the big element of contingency. I'm sorry if I repeat myself, but at least in this class I wasn't saying this yet. Uh, uh, Caesar crossing uh, Rubicon. And I like that example because, you know, since this is such a great heroic act, you uh, probably expect it to be some wild, dangerous river. No, you know what is the fucking Rubicon? A small stream, you get wet only here and so on. So, but the point is this one. Uh, uh, Hegelian, the Hegelian reading is not, it was predestined. Caesar, great guy. No. After he crossed Rubicon, you have to read all his life as preparation too. You know it was... Okay, I'm sorry if I repeat a line which you must know, but uh, maybe I often quote, but it's the best. The guy whom I already praised to you, one of you I think mentioned him, he's worth reading, but unfortunately his best work is published in French, although he also teaches at Stanford, Jean-Pierre Dupuy, the French theorist of catastrophe and rational choice. He's very intelligent. He incidentally also wrote one of the best analyses of Hitchcock's vertigo, but that's another story. Uh, okay, uh, 
He found a wonderful quote, you know, it's worth dying for to find, from Le Monde, you know, the French daily, where there were some 15 years ago, I think, elections, where the candidate in some pre-elections no, was uh, Edouard Balladur, who was at some point also prime minister. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Okay, it wasn't certain what will happen. And then Le Monde put a wonderful Hegelian formula. They wrote, if, if in the sense of contingent, if Monsieur Balladur will win next weekend's election, his victory will be necessary. And that's it, you know, once, and this is even, go to Alain Badiou, this is crucial about his theory of act, event, all that bullshit, no, that uh, this is why an event, or I speak more about an act, is precisely something which violates the field act, is not strategic thinking. In strategic thinking, you look around, make, you make a rational choice. You look around, what are the possibilities, and you choose the best possibility. In a true act, as they put it, you do something which retroactively creates its own possibility. It's paradoxically, by doing it, it appears crazy before you do it, but once you do it, it becomes understandable retroactively. And it's the same even for belief, which is why uh, here I had another debate with Fred Jameson, and it was wonderful, uh, where he told me that how sometimes Marxist revolutionaries have to refer to what may appear most irrational, uh, reactionary in theology as a model for how we should think, but not in this stupid liberal sense, yes, because you Marxists are the worst in reality, you know, theologists believing in common. No, it only, uh, you know, this basic uh, reversal of every authentic, I think I maybe mentioned this one already here, of every authentic faith, how you should never say, I believe in Christ because I was convinced by the arguments for it. You know, this is blasphemy. Who are you to judge it, you know? Like you say, I read uh, Bible, I read Talmud, I read Buddha, and okay, I had some doubts, but after thinking about it, I was... Every good theologist will tell you the opposite. It's not that you become a Christian because you understood the reasons. No, in order to understand reasons, <laughs> you already have to be a Christian. Uh, and now you will say, what has this to do with revolution? Ah, this is crucial. It concerns the status of Marxist theory. What Marx is really saying, it's not Stalin is saying this, that Marxism is a kind of a objective knowledge. You know, like, for example, uh, where does Stalin claim this? In this most terrible philosophical text of all times, you know, these 30 pages of sacred text, Stalin's, on dialectical and historical materialism, where he explains the growth of Marxism in Tsarist Russia. And he says like this, at that point, late 19th century, workers were still a tiny minority. But intelligent social scientists analyzed society and saw that al although workers are still a minority, if you take into account necessary historical process, you will see that they will become the crucial part, the subject of a revolution. So they've chosen to link themselves to the workers. This is, of course, cynical manipulative reasoning. Like, I look around and even if this horse now runs slowly, I know this is the winning horse, so I quickly join the future winners. You know, this reminds me of, you know who was Talleyrand? Talleyrand, the ultimate conformist, the, uh, the eternal foreign minister of France, under Napoleon, after Napoleon, all the time. He has a saying which I like so much, it's conformism at his best. Did you really use it here? I don't know. It's, uh, once he was, he was very much a bon vivant, you know, revolutions were going on, but he still received friends, luxury, <coughs> din, uh, lunches. Once he had a lunch with his friends, 
and they heard some street fighting, shooting out of their palace, no? And Talleyrand said, you, you see, our side is winning. And they asked him, okay, which side? He said, well, we'll see tomorrow. <laughs> 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 Who wins? <laughs> but that's almost uh, Stalin's point, you know? Why, if you read authentically Marx in his Hegelian view, it's the opposite. Here is the similarity with, uh, with uh, how religion functions. Marxism is not objective knowledge in the sense of, you know, you look at society, you see which direction wind is blowing, and then you join the winners, no? No. To, uh, how you, put it? you can see what Marxism is saying only from an engaged standpoint. And that's, I think, what is great in Marx. It's difficult to understand, read maybe the greatest philosophical work of entire Marxism, this young masterpiece by Lukács, uh, History and Class Consciousness, where he develops how the greatness of Marxism, even if it's wrong, I'm the first one to criticize many things, but is this idea that truth, precisely universal truth, is not an objective category, you know, in the sense of Let's say we are here fighting. We are not, we love each other, but let's say we are here fighting. The truth is not, I listen to you, to you, to you, <laughs> and then I say, you are all unilateral, but from a safe distance, I can... No, truth, universal truth, is always engaged truth. Now you will say, but what if you observe capitalism from a cold, objective way? You already, this is already to be engaged, but in a negative way, for capital. To give, this would be the position, that to give an objective view of existing society is already conformism, is already taking sides. There is no, no taking sides. But this doesn't mean, again, some kind of a pseudo Nietzscheanism, no? in the sense of, oh, there are just perspectives. No, no, that still is universal truth. But... And here, uh, uh, Alain, but you, is right. No? You can use this in the afternoon if I say something wrong. <laughs> uh, 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 but you know, uh, in this sense, but you also claims that truth for but you, the event, truth event, is universal. But as he makes it here, truth in contrast to knowledge is a subjectively engaged uh, category. You know, and like, let me give you a, a naive example. Bombing us with that, yeah. <laughs> let me give you a naive example. In Germany, again, the eternal stupid example. In Germany, Jews were a, an oppressed minority. But uh, the way to arrive at an objective description of situation in Germany. It's not to say, okay, Jews suffer, they exaggerate, the Nazis exaggerate, we have to strike the right balance. No. Jews were the symptom. It's only from that standpoint of the absolute victim that you can say the universal truth. Truth is, as, or as a language have put it, you know that uh, uh, surnumerary element, the symptomal point, and so on. It's only from engaged position from there that you that you get at the truth. It's a similar. Just uh, before we go on, uh, uh, it's a uh, uh, similar as this paradox uh, is also the paradox of activity or inactivity. I used it some by books, but to make my point clear, which I already made, I want to describe you, it's a little bit linked, but not totally to what I already talked, maybe even too much here, you know, all that bullshit, interpassivity or uh, can't laughter, how you can do it through others. Uh, what, and here with Alain, I totally agree. What would be that when he talks about act engagement fidelity, we should oppose it to a wonderful term, I think, of wrong, false activity. And I will give a very simple formal definition. It's an activity where you are active all the time, 
But the true stake of your activity, aim, is not to change things, but, you know, sometimes you have to be active all the time so that nothing changes. Now, again, don't be afraid. It's not a private obscenity, but it is an intimate detail. I will give you an honest example, and this is pure obsession and neurosis, uh, from my own life. I was in analysis with Miller uh, 30 years ago, Jacqueline Miller, and when the analysis started to go wrong, I was absolutely extra active all the time in the analysis. Okay, this was a Lacanian analysis, which means I knew in advance it will never last more than five minutes, you know. <laughs> and here we have another problem. I know I didn't use this example with uh, Miller. Uh, some of you who are kind of a within Lacanian dogma, maybe you even already use this example here. You can criticize me if I'm wrong or not. I always found problematic this Lacan's notion of short sessions. I think I even used this example here. You know, you know what speci was specific for Lacanians, that as a rule, their sessions are not the standard 50 minutes, but like if Lacan is well disposed, uh, you get five minutes. No? Otherwise, I've spoken with a lady from Bordeaux, who was an old lady now, who was in analysis with Lacan, and she told me that once he probably achieved world record. She entered the room, and Lacan said, 200 francs, you know, the like, there was no analysis, just she directly paid. But Lacan was a genius, because she told me, <coughs> she felt an incredible relief, like, you know, like, no work to do, no trauma, because here I like, as I tell you, Jacqueline Miller, who told one wonderful, evil, ironic thing, that, that psychoanalysis is even much better than capitalism. In capitalism, if you are the capitalist, uh, you pay a worker who works for you, but then, okay, you exploit him. But psychoanalysis is better. The analyst does all the work, but he pays you to work, you know. Like capitalism is kind of a dreamlike, uh, a psychoanalysis kind of dreamlike capitalism where the worker pays you to be able to work. But let's go on. So what Miller, uh, 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 sorry, yes, back to that temporality of analysis and so on. Miller had a wonderful idea of, uh, uh, not wonderful, his explanation of short session is this one. As a rule in analysis, the standard one, 50 minutes. Of course, you are not under pressure enough, usually, as a rule. There are exceptions. For the first 45 minutes, it's blah, blah, you lose time. Then, when you are under pressure, in the last couple of minutes, usually you stop bullshitting. You know what I mean? Like, at that point, even if you are not aware of it, the really important thing happens. When you are already under, the, under pressure, at any point the analyst can say, okay, the session is over. So, as Miller explained it once, Lacan's idea was, why not skip the 45 minutes and put the patient under pressure from the very beginning. So that when you lay down, you don't have this certainty, okay, okay, we have 50 minutes. No, at any point it can be over. So then this will hopefully bring you to, to put it in vulgar terms, to become productive immediately. Well, my problem is, does it really work? Isn't there a deeper structural necessity? Because on account of which you cannot get directly the precious five minutes. You know what I mean? That it's this apparently useless 45 minutes bullshitting which creates the ground for that to emerge. Well, what's, your, what's your reaction to the justification for it from the other side? So that's, that's, the, that's the justification from the, the prep side. But the justification for the other side, right? Is I'm we, stop, we stop the session the second 
that something's said, that, that this sort of there's, there's this kind of eruption in the session, and you stop it so that you don't actually recover it back over in the session. And I that's not Bruce Finch's Sorry, view. what are you talking about? I think this, this is Bruce Finch's view. Yeah, of, no, of because that. what I, I don't really forgot to correctly, I know that, but you have to do it in the right way. A very intelligent analyst knows how to discern really productive moment and this faked orgasmic moment. Oh, now I remember I saw how my father was fucking at ergo my mother or some stupidity like that. You know, this pseudo, as but you would have put it, pseudo events. And he told me that, uh, 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 sorry, uh, Milero, who has that, uh, that this is why a good analyst sometimes when he sees a pseudo event coming, it's a brutal strategy, but it usually works to interrupt you, a kind of a coitus in the room. No, you think now I will do a great act. Oh, this big scene from my youth, I remembered it. And if you smell a rat, a rat means a pseudo event, you know, then you should precisely brutally cut the pain. Like he thinks. I will deliver now the great moment, fuck off, I will, I will cut you here, you know. Uh, so, uh, uh, but again, uh, uh, the other thing is that it's more ambiguous because at another point, and here with all my conflicts with Miller, again, as I already told you, Jacqueline Miller, he is a genius, I mean, he is the only one who knows how to introduce Lacan really, okay, one among one of the few. Uh, he was sensitive enough to claim that at the same time there is this, and precisely in the Kafkaesque sense, bureaucratic element, which is absolutely crucial for psychoanalysis. You have to look at it as a kind of a blind ritual bureaucratic necessity, you know, every week at that time there are so many minutes and the Paradoxically, this helps a lot, this, demo, uh, this not democratic, did I say democratic, my God, bureaucratic. <laughs> uh, uh, because, okay, I already told you, let me make you another intimate confession, uh, nothing embarrassing, don't be afraid. Uh, this is what saved me. I was in a deep personal crisis, terribly in love, everything went wrong. It may sound stupid, incredible for you that I, once I was like that, you know? And I was really desperate, like in a suicidal mood. I, I didn't eat for a week, blah, blah. And then I started analysis with Miller, and I distinctly remember how this bureaucratic aspect probably, literally, saved my life. Because every day I ask myself, my God, should I kill myself? And then I always say, wait a minute, but let's wait till tomorrow. This afternoon I have a session. And, like, <laughs> and this pure sticking to ritual saved me. Because I needed this pure ritual, bureaucratic mechanism. I needed this for a week uh, or two to get over the worst of the crisis, you know. Uh, 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 then, okay, then things change, and then we come to what I wanted to tell you, uh, namely this, then I got fully engaged in pseudo-activity once I was normalized, which means, now I'm coming to my point about you, pseudo-activity, and so on. Namely, uh, uh, when I was normalized, normalized in the sense that I no longer was in a suicidal mood, started after two, three weeks to function normally, I, again, my obsessional neurotic attitude took over. And I had only one goal in analysis when I was the analyst. How to keep things from happening. Like, I was literally extra active, bullshitting, just to prevent, to sabotage that anything would happen. You know, in a substantial way, like... Like, for example, I prepared in advance, in detail, all my, even if I fake there, oh, I just had an idea, whatever, no, no. It was all planned up to a minute, you know, and I, as usually, as you can see now, as you can imagine, I was talking all the time, but it was pure pseudo-activity. You know why? Because I was talking all the time to prevent, to stop 
the horrible moment when I no longer talk and then Miller can ask me a really tough question, you know, what something could have happened. So you see my point. All my activity was here not to to not in order for something to happen, but to guarantee that nothing will happen. Which is why I distinctly remember when Miller said, eh bien, okay, it's over for today, I felt such a relief. Haha, <laughs> I made it. No, nothing happened. Okay, then this went on almost for a year, and then I needed a year, yes, to ask myself this totally common sense egotist but healthy question. Fuck it, why then should I be paying it, no? <laughs> because it was expensive, the analysis just made. But, but what I'm saying is that don't we often have a similar mechanism? For example, even I am usually part of it. Did it happen to you? You are with a group of people, family, friends, and so on, and you know it's hanging in the air some tough, very unpleasant topic to be debated. And in such situations, I feel a terrible pressure to, in my usual style, you know it, to tell dirty jokes, amuse, but the whole point is to, you know, if I talk enough, maybe people will forget about that traumatic point and so on. And here, again, I agree with Alain, but you, that uh, this is what was at the origin of my the polemic with that guy, another version of Voldemort, the one whose name shouldn't be pronounced, I will pronounce it Simon Critchley, you know. <laughs> because my point was that the kind of protest activity that he was advocating is precisely such an activity, and this is for me typical for many leftists, you know. <laughs> they like these empty ritualistic protests, which for me quite often are, let's pretend to be to do something so that we make it sure that nothing will happen. You know who provided a wonderful formula of this, who knew this? Uh, he was not just a liberal idiot, the way he is uh, usually uh, referred to. How is the guy called? Uh, George Orwell. He, I quote it in one of his early texts from already late 30s, I think, before. His first step to fame was, I think, uh, how much to Catalonia or what, his memoirs on, from the uh, Spanish uh, Civil War. But before, I forgot which book, he has the most cynical acerbic analysis of this liberal British left. And he says, they, these rich academics who have sympathies for the poor and so on, they talk all the time about how we need a change. But he says, this works like a superstitious activity in the sense of if we talk enough about it, maybe it will not happen, you know. That literally talking all the time about change is a superstitious strategy to make it sure that nothing will change. And I claim that till now, this is why now many radical leftist intellectuals in Europe and so on are so confused because this was, I claim, the main strategy. How were you till recently a radical leftist in Europe? And here I do have a problem with Alain. I think that his pro Maoism enters the frame. You pick up a country which is possibly far away. You know, it's easy to be for a revolution which is at a proper distance so that it doesn't really affect your life, you know. You can go on with your career, but you can say to anyone, oh, my heart is sweet, name it. Mao is China, Cuba, now it's Venezuela, often Chavez. The point is, it must be far away, you know. Authentic things are happening there, and my heart is there, but I can still go on here with. So, uh, again, uh, I think that a lot of protests are done in that way. I even, and here I got in conflict with Simon Critchley, I even suspected that that big uh, protests against the Iraq war, which were maybe till recent explosions, the biggest protests, that they were part of, objectively, even if they meant it sincerely, they were this type of protest like, the war will happen, so what? But to save our soul, let's do it, no? And we will feel good. 
You know, leftists like to play this Cassandra off. Okay, we couldn't do anything, but we warrant you, uh, 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 we made them draw so So, again, uh, 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 so I loved the reaction of President Bush, the son, incidentally, taking into account those who were candidates, Republican candidates, in the recent, uh, uh, no, before Mitt Romney, the others, I think you agree that. George Bush, the younger, is a genius compared to them. Uh, my favorite, I think he is not human, Rick Santoro, you know, he was my guy. I think there are serious doubts if he is human, you know. But, uh, but what I want to say is that here I got soft on Bush because, listen, he made for that he will forever be in my heart. He made, you remember it, a wonderful slip of tongue when uh, he says, he, it's really like that Freud's case from, from uh, Heinrich Heine, you remember that uh, when a guy is asked, a rich guy, a poor guy who is, uh, who is, uh, uh, who is invited to dinner uh, by a wealthy man and then the friend asked him, how was it? And he said, beautiful, I was treated in a very familiar way, you know, like familiar way and millionaire, you know, like you condense them. And do you know that if some of your Americans, your president displayed the same genius? It's really, you know, remember when once he was defending himself and he said, uh, uh, I was misunderestimated. <laughs> <laughs> Is this a beautiful, I mean, I claim that idiots like Rick Santorum, Sarah Palin, I don't think they are able even to produce <laughs> Such an intelligent, beautiful slip of talk, you know. You have to have, sorry? So, uh, if I could move back just for one second. You know, in Adrian Johnston's book on you and uh, about you. I haven't read it yet. The Cadence of Change and so on. Okay. You know, he puts this nice notion that, um, you know, typically we see Baju as sort of an apolitical working outside of the state and so on. But he puts Baju's uh, formulation of politics into Lacanian terms and argues that the precise moment that we should act is when the big other of the state goes into imagine from symbolic to imaginary. And yeah, yeah, at that yeah. precise moment, it seems to me the the ambiguity for the left precisely yeah. to act. You know? As, so it's yeah. one on the sidelines yeah. with zero sort of equipment as yeah. gauge yeah, yeah. at yeah. what at uh -huh. what moment. So yeah. not to side with Critchley by any means, but simply um, you know, there's also this notion within Occupy, the uh, agonistic uh, democracy moment of remaining in the hysterical space and not defining demands for as long as possible to bring uh, more uh, yeah. together. Yeah. And then, you know, so I, I wonder, like, um, th there seems to be a latent apolitic apoliticism within this approach to stay the sub subtractive, what Peter Hallworth calls the politics of prescription in which he precisely criticizes for being able to Yeah. Yeah? So yeah. how do we uh, have the sort of equipment for which to... Right. All I can do is to answer directly, because you know along the lines that you suggested now, Peter, Peter Holbert, even in a friendly way, I have good relation with him, is once at that, he says, I oscillate between three options and it's never clear where I stand. He says, sometimes I sound as a, a Simon Critchley caricature, no? so that is to say that I... I wait for a big violent act, blah, blah, stuff. Uh, sometimes I sound as this almost caricaturized subtraction part to be politics, yes. the true act is to do nothing, and sometimes I sound as a good pragmatist, mm -hmm. you know. Well, uh, my answer to this is, of course, you know that famous one, coffee or tea, yes, please. Why, cho why choose? There are situations where clearly, where every activity tends to be co-opted. And Alain have a wonderful quote, I three, four times, but you quote him. He says somewhere how in the ordinary state of things, the main function is not to get engaged in this pseudo-activity. Like his quote is, better to do nothing than to do things which, even if it is uh, critical, plays the game of the system. Because my Austrian friend, Robert Faller, the one who invented the term of, uh, uh, of uh, interpassivity. Uh, uh, I often use it, maybe you know, he used this nice metaphor from boxing, of clinching, you know, that we are totally wrong if we think that 
we have to fight for a dialogue, but no, no intelligent liberal opponents, they are like boxers in clinching, they try to embrace you, you know, like Bill Clinton, remember his reaction to Occupy Wall Street. Yeah, they are wild, not practical, but they have a point, we should come together, see what we can do together, blah, blah. And here I'm for party politics, so I'm not always for some kind of activity. I even written there, I remember, around Wall Street, how uh, the thing to do then is to avoid this pressure, okay, translate it into practical terms. In the present situation, I quote there, whom do I quote? Is it again Saramago? No, no, that guy, that old, uh, uh, I think John Berger, that writer I quote, who said, we don't yet have the language to the new, mm -hmm. for the new. Mm -hmm. Any way to translate it into practical demands would have meant to be co-opted, mm -hmm. you know. So there are situations where precisely we, even if we are a ridiculous minority, we should do nothing, we should reject dialogue. Uh, and I can tell you it works as a strategy, even in a very modest level. I remember when I was young, uh, dissidents, when the system party, Communist Party, rule started to disintegrate, they became Bill Clintons, you know. They desperately tried to come to us, debate, let's debate, and they were really open because they were scared, full of shit, you know, like, uh, like they knew probably there will be so-called democracy and they were, uh, and the strategy I advocated was precisely, no, you know, we got all the invitations to the Central Committee and some of my friends accepted those invitations and went there and spit on them, you are worse than Zion, and they thought then they will be criticized, maybe even they wanted to be arrested a little bit, because this was the conformism of dissidents. They worked, like, it was clear that there will be democracy and where was their badge of honor, you know, like, they wanted a little bit of some small trial arrest so that they, they will be able to claim afterwards, oh, we were victims. Uh, uh, communists were too intelligent. You spit on them. They said, thank you very much for these interesting remarks. So nice that you come, you see, we should talk more, and so on, and so on. So this is one strategy which has its place. At the same time, and I think we should avoid blackmail here, at the same time, there is strategic, not opportunism, pragmatism. And I will give you, maybe you know this line, I'm sorry, an example. The reason, and surprise, surprise, I share this with Alain, but you. Do you remember when, not exactly another of those whose name shouldn't be mentioned, uh, uh, Tariq Ali? the great British uh, leftist, he likes to promote himself that this is part of his self-propaganda machinery. You know that early Rolling Stones hit from beggar's banquet, sorry, this is my youth, street fighting man. He claims I'm the one, uh, Mick Jagger wrote that song for me or whatever, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's enough to cure you of this to be invited by him once I was, and you know, he's this typical leftist who criticized me as bourgeois traitors, and then you visit him. Hempstead, already in the park, a mega two floors villa with three, four servants. Well, fuck it, I like to be a radical evolutionary like that. No. So, uh, to go on, okay. Uh, 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 he wrote a book, with, can I give you a proof of what is real hatred in theory? You know that, uh, did you notice if some of you followed it? You don't have to. How? the volume of first proceedings of our Alain, but you and me, Communism Conference, paradoxically appeared in Spanish, Greek, even French, before the English edition. Although it was all settled with Warsaw. You know why? The title of the book you remember is The Idea of Communism. Okay, they told me at of some pure bullshit, like we have a problem with marketing strategy. Fuck it, verse or three, four, what marketing strategy? It was as simple as that. Tariq Ali was mad at, at me that he wasn't invited. So he is, together with Perry Anderson, one of the secret bosses of Warsaw. They postponed the book, and in between, Tariq Ali wrote, published by, I think, Chicago University Press, 
I was really mad at him there. A short book, you know with what title? Yes, yes, the idea of communism. I mean, this is sacred, you know. But let me go on. So Tariq Ali then lately wrote a book on Obama. You know, this typical cheap, like, Obama, black face, but like the black mask is falling apart, and beneath you see George Bush's face, you know. And, but you and me, we were opposed to this. We said first, this is a little bit stupid, like, what did they expect, that Obama will introduce socialism with the United States or what? No, the reason I still have, I know all the disgusting compromises he made, I know, but for one thing, apart from the fact that nonetheless, and Alain told me this, listen, whatever you say about the United States, a black guy was elected president. This is something. I doubt if in Europe this is possible. Like this would be the same as imagine an Algerian immigrant president of France. Imagine a Pakistani president of United Kingdom. Imagine a Turk president of Germany. Ah, ah, ah. So, you know, let's not just in European way make fun of stupid Americans. You know what I mean, no? Second thing, this is what Alain told me, that uh, I still think, although Clinton already did it, but he made more compromises, that that debate on universal health care was an extremely important debate. Why? Because I know, don't convince me, that the result was a total compromise, blah, blah. But obviously, didn't that debate touch a certain crucial point, touch the nerves of American ideological space, which is this false ideological notion of freedom of choice. You know, American ideology pretends to ignore precisely the Hegelian notion of concrete freedom, which means uh, sometimes, paradoxically, if you get too much choice, it effectively limits your freedom. You know, choice can also be a limitation. Let's, let me give you a classical example. Do you remember... Uh, do you remember, uh, uh, you don't, it's too much, when uh, this uh, new labor, blah, 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 Anthony Giddens, sim uh, similar, idea, you know where, what, which is the center of, of uh, new labor theory, this second modernity, third way theorists, LSE, you don't know what LSE means, Libyan school economics, yes, that's crucial. Yes. You know, I was really mad at that guy, theories of democracy, David Held, because two years before, I was there at some debate at London School of Economics, and he attacked me, you know, this usual liberal, the New Republic. You Lacanians, you are too totalitarian, no, no. Well, at least fuck you, we didn't get money from Gaddafi. You know? <laughs> I mean, they are so shameless, you know, accusing us who are, my God, I'm now in deep shit. I already got notices. They published that text, one page and a half, uh, in defense of pussy riot, no? And only got messages that I should be very careful, try to reserve that probably this uh, Saturday, no, no, sorry, next Saturday, I go to Russia that they got some hints, the organizers, that probably they will not uh, uh, let me in, you know. But let me go on. So, okay, uh, what I'm saying is that another idea of, listen, let's take, for example, water electricity. Okay, no, sorry, first, yes, Anthony Giddens and so on. This was ideology at its worst. You know, when, you know what is one of the trends in latest decades in capitalism? That even if you don't have high unemployment, it's more and more that you don't have a long-term job, but one, two, three year short contracts, you know. And now comes somebody like Anthony Giddens or this postmodern, whatever, no, it's the second but the capitalist who says, Ah, if you are afraid of this, it is because you still stick to your essentialist identity. You should rather use this situation of having to tremble and look for a new contract every year or two as giving you a new freedom to choice, to almost like kind of an economic version of Judith Butler's performatively enacting <laughs> sexual identities. So, uh, you see how here it's a clear, you know, when, for example, it must happen in, in your country, in Slovenia, we have not the usual reform. The obligatory socialist healthcare is 
reduced to almost nothing, and then how do they justify this? We want to give you more freedom of choice. You can choose to pay more or less. But this is a typical example for me of non-freedom masked as additional freedom of choice. And I, I think that what is freedom? No, I'm not now selling you the bullshit of freedom is this uh, Stalin is the real freedom or whatever. My favorite guy here is, uh, you remember Ceausescu, the boss of Romania. Once he gave this perfect answer to a Western journalist who asked him, but there is no freedom in your country because people are not allowed to leave. Uh, the old Stalinist said, yes, but we have here a conflict of freedoms. One, freedom is freedom to travel abroad, but the other freedom is freedom to have a stable home. So we prefer this real freedom to have a stable home, and so on. <laughs> I cannot, but, you know, which is, sorry to get lost in this, but I love it. You know, there is only one genius in this world. It's the greatest, okay, apart from Kim Jong-il and Kim Il-sung, it's Stalin, no? You know which is his greatest genius? Do you know that in 34, I think, the Soviet penal code, code was rendered much tougher. They lowered death penalty to, I think, 12 or 13 years. To cut a long story short, if you are a 13 years old kid, you can already be shot for treason, whatever. Why? Hey, it's clear. Because they have these big trials and many of accused, Bukharin and so on, had a son or a daughter exactly of that age, you know. So the idea was, Let's put, it's not only that we can beat you, like, they even didn't beat Bukharin, but they told him clearly, like, ah, ah you have a son, what if we discover that, uh, and here, sorry if I get lost, but this is important, uh, 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 because as to how Stalinism works, I got a terrible experience, I visited uh, 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 an institute, for social studies, not in Frankfurt, they also have one smaller one in Hamburg. I have friends there. And they told me a wonderful story which tells you so much about the irrationality of Stalinism. In the mid-90s, when archives opened a little bit, of course, not only in Soviet, ex-Soviet Union, they bribed some official and got complete file of some Stalinist show, of a Stalinist show trial, not a big one just in some factory, local one, that's why, and they made a wonderful discovery, which tells you a lot about the madness of the system. It was just in some big factory, local, out of Moscow, things didn't function well, and then, you know how it goes in Stalinism, things don't function well. Who is guilty? Not the party, they are geniuses, we have the best, not the workers, they support the party, so there must be spies, foreign blood, whatever. So they did it what every decent Stalinist did. KGB groups came there, they cons you do it creatively, retroactively. You know, they, 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 uh, they composed a list of who are the traitors, and then they arrested them and beat them, so that they, it's a more creative approach, not dogmatic. And then something happened. You imagine what? To their shocking surprise, they discovered that one of the guys who was accused in their nice paranoia of being English spy really was an English spy. Yeah. It was total panic. They sent special messages to Moscow, what do we now and so on. And the point was that this was lucky for that guy. Because as a result of this, he was no longer beaten, he got a special treatment, better food, because you know, he became an element for the possible exchange, you know, to change him. But you see the madness. So it wasn't only that they were cheating in the sense of they were too tough, even they, if they were not sure they condemned you. No, the premise of the game was that you are not guilty. You know, it was a big surprise if, you, if they discovered that you really are guilty. No, 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 this is why, you know, Stalinism bothers me so much. I, and this is my, as you probably know, big reproach to, to uh, Frankfurt School. Did you notice a strange things in critical analysis of all of them, from Adorno to Habermas? Of course they mention here and there Stalinism as horror, but name me one detailed good analysis on Stalinism. For example, Habermas. Read 
I make you a practical test, maybe in some journalist interview, but basically, read all books by Habermas. Could you guess from them that there were two Germanies, East or West? I don't think he ever even mentions it and so on. And I find this very mysterious. Why? I know I did my homework. There are a couple of, uh, there is the book uh, Soviet Marxism by Marcuse, but it's a very short specific analysis of Khrushchev's people. But it is as if what exists is anti-Semitism, fascism, and so on, but nothing about Stalinism. And I had a big fight with that Turkish Habermasian girl, Seyla Benhabib, who was at uh, the School of Social Research. Now I think she's at Harvard or moved somewhere else. Because she attacked me ferociously for this. We had a shouting match. And then her counter-argument was that I don't take into account the Cold War situation, where to criticize directly Stalinism would have meant that you played the Cold War game, you know, like that. This is why they didn't do it, which is a total stupidity. Because, no, if you look at their political affiliations, it's very sad to read this. You know, when there was 100 years of Adorno's birth, ah, you know where we are here. You know what happened down there in Visp? Theodor Adorno down there. He was walking here, somewhere up here, got a heart attack, they brought him down to the Visp hospital and there he, you know, okay, whatever. What I want to say is that uh, uh, he, there were a, a couple of years ago thick biographies of Adorno and the saddest thing from them is you cannot even imagine how deeply Frankfurt School, after they returned from the United States, in around 1950 and re-established the Frankfurt School, well, in Frankfurt, how deeply they were integrated into West German establishment. Even some letters are quoted in the book where it's clear that Horkheimer, the boss, was much closer to Christian Democrats, Adenauer, than to Social Democrats. He didn't trust Social Democrats, and now comes the ultimate irony. Uh, so easy. And I don't think it's the same as that the Lesian Israeli army. It's not serious, but it's nice. And I don't think that in any way, uh, uh, how should put it, diminishes the glory of the Les. But nonetheless, it's a nice data. You know what was in the early 50s one of the main sources of money for Frankfurt School Institute? Bundeswehr, the new German army. You know that Adorno was offered a tremendous large project, because he was known as that, you know, authoritarian personality, the study. So the army got the idea, we want a new, not Nazi, democratic army, and who but Adorno, who knew about uh, authoritarian personality, should know how to do it. So they offered Adorno a tremendous amount of money to do a big research of a profile of new West German officer, you know. Adorno had the honor to uh, reject this, but still they did some other projects nonetheless. I'm getting lost. Let's go on. Bukharin, uh, uh, yes, that's 12, 10 years old, punished to death. Now you have the genius of Comrade Stalin. You know what happened? Of course, some Western bullshitting liberal supporters of Soviet Union were shocked. You know, how can they do it? 12 years death penalty. So I don't know which of these Western intellectual admirers of Stalin, I'm not sure was it Leon Feuchtwanger or Romain Roland, raised the topic during a visit to Stalin. How can you do this? Uh, there is one comrade Stalin. You know what was his answer? This shows the great triumph of education and progress of our country. Our education is so brilliant that Children of 12 years already have the maturity of a fully grown-up person. So fuck them, they should also pay the price. <laughs> Maybe not, uh, only Stalin can say something like this. Okay, sorry. Uh, uh, but you know what? Evil again, but now, okay. Let's do a little bit of fucking Buddhism. Nonetheless, you know. <coughs> sorry. So, uh, uh, yes, okay. We will, uh, okay. Uh, uh, let me maybe begin with, uh, at the, uh, no, maybe I should leave this to later, the most difficult 
part of. Uh, because first, yes, first let me state something clearly. When we talk about Buddhism, I don't mean it in a diminishing way, in any way, dismissing way. I think that ultimately the only thing that comes close to what Lacan tries form to formulate as ethics of psychoanalysis, it is this Buddhist radical notion of enlightenment and so on and so on. Uh, the problem I see is, let me first focus on the ethical problem. Uh, aha, yeah. Uh, I, I here rely on debates with my Buddhist friends. First problem. Uh, you know, and they admit it to me that this is a problem. You know, you know basically the story. Buddha was, and this is, I think, the key to explain the enigma of it. You know that Buddha was a kind of contradictory term, agnostic materialist, no? He said, God doesn't interest me. This is beyond. What only interests me in a totally pragmatic way is people suffer. How can we help them? You know, okay. But isn't it ironic? And it's a key to understand this. How? This spiritual orientation, I don't want to call it a religion, it's false, which began as the most pragmatic attitude, like screw metaphysical questions, who cares about God, what matter is people suffer, what can we do, ended up in its last stage, that is to say Tibetan Buddhism, as the most elaborated, ridiculous, religious dogmatism that you can imagine. And I don't think it's simply a story of loss of authenticity, betrayal, and so on. There is this uh, 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 a Buddhist guy, Tibetan Buddhist told me, he, I to asked him this, how do you unite this, like this highest asceticism, theoretical asceticism, in the sense of don't bullshit me with uh, your metaphysical discourse stupidities. I just want to help people who suffer concretely. I locate, you know, Buddha's four wisdoms. It's simple. It's the causes of suffering, how to diminish, and so on and so on. So I hope you know that all that bullshit about reincarnation and so on, you know, you, uh, it comes afterwards, mostly from from, from Mahayana, who are the original bad guys for me. Uh, and then, at the end, you reach, they even published, before they threw me out because of politics, a couple of years ago in New York Times, a text of mine, where, I, I don't, I don't, that still is something so beautiful about state bureaucracy. I think Kafka was deeply right when he wrote that in our godless times, the only contact we have with divine dimension is state bureaucracy, you know. It's literally true in China. Maybe you remember, if some of you were stupid enough to read my book, The Passage Where I Debate This, you know what happened a couple of years ago in China? Do you know the story? Their Ministry for Religious Affairs introduced a bureaucratic procedure for reincarnation. Like, you are not just re it's, I'm not kidding. I thought it's kind of a joke, so again, I asked my friends in Beijing, and they told me, no, no, it's true. Literally, you have to announce your plan, you write to the ministry, and they say, okay, we will acknowledge your reincarnation. And, of course, you know what are the real stakes. They want to control who will be the next Dalai Lama, you know. And now you have a wonderful obscenity where Dalai Lama, <laughs> to prevent the Chinese taking over, at least I read this in newspapers, but I don't like Dalai Lama too much. You know why? Again, because I spoke with some Tibetan Buddhists who told me there are two Dalai Lamas. There is Dalai Lama for you in the West, and the Dalai Lama we know is incredibly still authoritarian. It's okay, I don't know what's true. But the point is here, Dalai Lama did a nice thing. He said, why this old bullshit reincarnation? Let's vote. Let's do some assembly and they will vote who will be the next Dalai Lama. 
Chinese authorities accused Dalai Lama of blasphemy, like, no, Tibet is still a sacred procedure, <laughs> because they want to control it. But then, my dream is this one, and for this it's worth dying, I claim. Can you imagine then the situation? You are an old monk, and you write this fill in the form, born here, I plan reincarnation, I want to be reborn as, I don't know, a beautiful young woman or a nice horse, and then the state bureaucracy answers you, sorry, all those places are taken. In your region, there are just some worms, worms, some mad dogs. Make your choice, but you want to be there and so on. I love this idea. Okay, but uh, back to the serious point. My Tibetan friend gave me a very good answer. Again, when I told him, how can something which started as a beautiful, dismissing all religion, pragmatic attitude. Fuck all dogma. People suffer. What can we do? And again, the only goal is a pragmatic one. How to prevent, or not prevent, okay, diminish the amount of suffering. How can you end up in, you know, these totally ridiculous rituals, everything codified and so on. And the guy gave me a perfect answer. He told me, but don't you see, it's exactly the same. That is to say, we justify all these ridiculous rituals precisely by pragmatic reasons. Our goal is not to theorize, he told me, but to effectively diminish suffering. And we discover that ordinary people, if you give to them pure Buddha, they will still suffer. But if you give them complex rituals, that they work. They work much better than direct agnostic enlightenment. Purely, okay, but let's go on. So what's the problem for me with, uh, you know, Hinayana was the original radical Buddhism. Mahayana was the first step towards religion. Mahayana is the large wheel, you know. The idea is like Plato. I simplify it very much. The two truths, you know. The idea is that this radical pure enlightenment is only for the elite, and they were honest. This elite is not the uh, ruling classes, you know, but those who are spiritually strong. And for ordinary people, you have to have uh, more relaxed rules and so on and so on. But where things go wrong is uh, here. Do you know the notion of bodhisattva? This is, the idea is this one. This is a guy who loves humanity so much that although he is already up there, no, up there it's wrong to say, but reached enlightenment, he voluntarily, out of the sympathy for the suffering of others, as it were, turns back into ordinary stupid material reality, he, as it were, out of love and compassion, postpones his own salvation to help others. I claim, and I have a debate with a uh, Hinayana guy who told me, the moment you do this, you accept the notion of Bodhisattva, you already mystify Buddhism in a spiritualist way. In what sense? The whole point of radical Buddhism, and that's why I like him, is that it's not a European or Indian Hindu style of escape into some kind of uh, higher spiritual realm. You know this basic Zen or even early Buddhist story, how usually it's said it's very simple with an apple. First you think, you look at an apple, this is an apple. Then you go through all spiritual bullshit and see this is nothing, whatever, chemistry, and at the final point of wisdom you again see this is an apple. Okay, it's an apple against the background of sunyata, of void, but it's an apple again. In the same sense, all truly radical Buddhists will tell you that when you reach nirvana, you are not in another world. You are here. You move in the same reality. You interact with people and so on. Just with your own. Uh, what Lacanians would have called subjective destitution, radical subjective shift. But that's crucial. So, what Hinayana guy told me is, 
If you accept this radical Buddhist insight that when you are enlightened, you don't, you are not like this ridiculous idea, you are up there in your, your spiritual trance and then you forget to eat, to shit, whatever, you have to be recalled down. You are fully here. So again, the point is a very simple one. If you are fully here, then why do we need a bodhisattva? You can be up there and still act here. Full. You know what I mean? The notion of bodhisattva already introduces a minimum of trans of sorry of transcendence, which is foreign. Second point, and it's most dangerous politically. We all know Lacan taught us this, and Deleuze knew this, and so, so uh, we are all good guys, you know. It's I hope you admit this as an old Maoist, nonetheless, I will tell you. You know this Mao's distinction between contradictions within the people which should be resolved through debate and contradictions between the people and the enemies of the people or the other term, antagonistic and non-antagonistic contradictions, no, where you chop heads, whatever. So I hope that our debates are, although I'm afraid you will be tougher, are still debates within the people. No, okay. So what I, the lesson was really, I distrust politics which is based on sacrifice. I don't like politics where the justification is sacrifice yourself. You know, like this emotion, as it were, politics of emotional blackmail. I could have been happy there, but look how I love you. I came down to this misery to help you. So let me tell you another story here. The tour. I will come back to Buddhism. Uh, uh, my good friend, I hope you didn't hear the story, Adam Kotsko, an intelligent uh, Chicago theologist. Okay, not too intelligent because he was stupid enough to write a book on me. <laughs> Seriously, he's a good guy. He wrote now a wonderful book on why do we love so much uh, sociopaths. It's a short book, 100 pages, booklet on latest trends in TV series. He simply noticed to what extent the heroes of this series are psychopaths, sociopathic figures. And then he nicely introduces three levels. One is almost my favorite, you know, figures like, uh, like, 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 uh, like uh, 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 Homer Simpson or who, you know, this kind of a, his sociopathy is just this joyful primitive egotism, you know. He likes to, to attack his friends, lay traps, and then he's so primitively glad. <laughs> I screwed you, you know. This kind of a primitive revenge egotist exploiting. Then you have next level of psychopath, these ruthless achievers. You know, like some figures in The Wire who, for any price, you know, just to get your success, you cheat, you steal, you even kill. And the third figure of sociopath would be this, he calls them redeemers. You know, people who are ready to sacrifice themselves to kill everything to save us. Uh, the model would be here, uh, Jack Bauer in 24. You know, he's ethical fanatic, but ready to torture. And here comes the genius of Kotzko. You know, who is for him the worst of these sociopathic redeemers? Dr. House. I agree, I really hate that guy. Okay. But then comes the Lacanian genius. Skotsko said, this doesn't mean that we should simply uh, reject this as uh, bourgeois ideology, blah, blah. He said, there is in each of these three figures an emancipatory potential. We just have to put them in different contexts. And he goes one by one, no, he begins with, uh, okay, let's begin with Jack Bauer. He says, uh, the good thing is that Jack Bauer, nonetheless, is a guy who is ready to sacrifice everything, including his life, his well-being, for a cause. Okay, that cause may be a wrong cause, but fuck it. To fight our emancipatory struggle, you need sometimes this, no? The point, as Scott Scott develops very nicely, is not that Jack Bauer is a sociopath, but that he's not sociopathic enough that, you know, the cause is still the cause of the existing world. So 
she's sociopathy is too much in service of the existing social order. Then he says, let's look at figures who would be this achiever, like in The Wire. You know that, uh, not, not, is it Stringer Bell, that big guy who betrays? Okay, the point is this kind of a ruthless business-oriented gangster, and even here, he, Kotzka says, wait a minute, we need people like this, ruthless calculators, like people who know how to achieve. And then, finally, that's the most beautiful part, he says, if we should be afraid of something is in progressive struggle, is this sacrificial figure. Or, uh, no, he says, we should be like Homer Simpson, you know. Screw the enemy, ha ha, idiot, you fell down. You know, he locates the, uh, the uh, emancipatory dimension of Simpson precisely in this kind of a naive joy in his evil, you know, ha <laughs> ha, so glad you slip down, you know, you know this, how, and uh, I claim that maybe, isn't it these three features together, the best image of what a fighter for freedom today should be, we should be like Jack Bauer in fighting, in ready to risk, like Stringer Bell and those efficient gangsters know how to do it, and we shouldn't cry and be sacrificial, but like Homer Simpson <laughs> attitude. And the greatest compliment I did is, well, I don't know in which country, I developed this idea, a lady, she was even a beautiful lady, I noticed it, uh, told me something, told me, this was really beautiful, I think it's a lie, it's not true, she told me, but my God, you are describing yourself, you know. <laughs> you are dead. The point was especially the time like this Homer Simpson. <laughs> Screw you, you fucked up, you know. No, uh, seriously. Okay, so, uh, I didn't lose my thread. Let's go back to Simpson. So, uh, no, sorry, to Simpson. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine, it's fine, no? uh, so, uh, uh, I, the, the pro this is for me the first problem, this uh, Mahayana problem. No, I think that the moment you accept this bodhisattva logic, you already have a, a certain logic of sacrifice, guilt, and so on, we should reject it. The second problem that emerges is basically uh, the repetition of the same problem. And here I really went into debates with Buddhists. I think I even mentioned it today, yesterday I went this to you. It's the problem of the following one. On the one hand, the goal of Buddhism is enlightenment, like to acquire this radical subjective distance from being caught into the... What do you call that? Sorry? What do you call that? Because you step out. If this is not radical, stepping out of the, what's the term, wheel of desire. Okay, but then, yeah. Okay, we can say it's not radical, but if this is not radical, then I don't know what radical is. I mean, you know what I mean? That you really step out. Okay, I know the point. Okay, I agree with you. It's not radical in the sense that you don't step anywhere else, you know. Okay, acquire a distance. Uh, between, I think I already mentioned this even here, between this and goodness. Like, you know, the entire economy of Buddhism is an attempt to convince you, and this is why they already go into this bureaucratic, except Zen, Zen is here more, more radical, step how, you know, to become enlightened, you have first to practice charity, to be good, blah, blah, and then, why this? Here I am on the side of the terrible militarist Suzuki, who says, no, Buddhism, Zen Buddhism is a practice of, is a technique of meditation, and you can be authentically enlightened, and you can still be a torturer, a fascist, a communist. He heroically accepts this gap, and I think this is the correct position. And I get great debates in China, where some Buddhists there are also under the pressure of the new state religion, Confucianism, and so on, you know. Do you know my old joke? I was in China, and they told me we have socialism with uh, Chinese values, blah, 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 no? And I told them, that they told me it's no longer communism, we call it harmonious society, you know. And I asked them, okay, 
I'm stupid, define me. what is harmonious society? And they told me harmonious, they quote some uh, Kung Fu Chia bullshit, no? Harmonious society is society where everyone is at his or her place. In a harmonious society, father is a good father, leader a good leader, pupil a good pupil, worker a good worker, and I exploded. I said, my God, now we are over all these problems of multicultural uh, communication. In Europe, we call this corporate fascism, you know, like, <laughs> finally, we find a language to communicate. But seriously, so uh, they try desperately again to play this game of steps, you know. You begin by not killing, by not stealing, you know, and grow. As if this everyday morality is a necessary step towards final <laughs> enlightenment. As if enlightenment in Zen it's called Satori, whatever. As if enlightenment is just the culmination of this gradual ethical growth. But honest radical, radical, okay, again, you can kill me, why radical? Buddhists admitted to me that basically they cheat here. There is no connection. Why not draw the opposite conclusion, which is when you are enlightened and have this inner distance, why even care? Why not to live just for immediate present, they admitted that from the entire logic of enlightenment, for example, you can also draw the conclusion of carpe diem, live for the moment, direct hedonism. There is no necessity. So I think, and this now brings me to my point, some of you hinted at it, and again, I emphasize it very much. This is not my criticism of Buddhism. Uh, this is its moment of truth, if it admits a gap. And it's a very harsh lesson, ethical. And this is, for me, Buddhism at its greatest. What kind of a gap? Someone can have the innermost, whatever we call it, Satori, spiritual enlightenment, and still you are a brutal piece of shit, torturer, and so on, in your everyday life. You're missing compassion. Compassion. Ah, no, I'm not. Compassion is the nastiest term here. If you look at how it was practically used, for example, Suzuki. Fuck Suzuki. Suzuki who was popular with, uh, with students uh, in the 60s, no? You know that the same Suzuki wrote some nice texts in the late 30s and early 40s? And uh, his... Uh, he used the term of compassion to justify Japanese aggression on China. He says Chinese are like stupid children. They don't see how our gun, which is shooting them, is a gun of love. And you know, they do this typical trick Buddhists here. Okay, you will say, but nonetheless it's killing. And then they get caught in this strategic calculation. They say, yes, but sometimes that was of course the logic. Sometimes you should do a little bit of violence to prevent larger violence. And he accepts that. Not only this. Now I will tell you, but maybe you know it. I quoted this a couple of times in my books. Then, uh, uh, so, uh, or look at Tibet. You know how much they manipulate with this uh, compassion. For example, they don't kill a living being. There. You know all these stupid stories, you could see from that Brad Pitt movie, how when they are digging a hole for, I don't know what movie theater, the, the, the uh, Buddhist uh, uh, priest insists, no, no, be very careful when you cut earth, you know, with a shelf so that you don't cut into two some worm or whatever. <laughs> yeah, but, and they didn't have that penalty. Of course not, they did just a, a nicer thing. Let's say they wanted to get rid of you, no? They whipped you, and then in winter they chained you to a tree, no? So no, I agree with you. I mean, each one of these countries have taken Buddhism and, and based it based on their own interpretation, just like any other organized Yeah, but what I'm saying is something more radical. I agree with you. That we have to accept the gap. But the actual teachings of the Buddha, at the end, when he supposedly went, you know, experienced nirvana, he realized that... You know, that what? I have to be compassionate towards myself. I have to take care of myself to be able to take care of others. And that there is no, there is no difference between me and 
the real world. This is nirvana, the state that I'm in currently. Yeah, well, all I'm saying is, and what I don't get is, to what concrete ethical consequences does this lead? Why can't I go on killing and say, this is my world? Can you explain this to me? Why? What prevents me from saying, yes, I'm in this state, no city transcendence, this is it, but it's part of my world, I torture you, I rape you, I kill you. Why not? <laughs> Why not? I don't think. Okay, now you will say compassion. But uh, compassion, uh, the, the, the whole point is suffering and so on and so on. But, uh, but, but my first point here again would have been that uh, the goal, if you look at nirvana, or however you call it, satori, I don't see why by fully authentically being there you cannot uh, still do, as it were, nasty, nasty things. So again, my point is not that this doesn't make Satori or Nirvana a very authentic experience. I just think we should be honest to admit the gap. And sorry if I repeat now my old story, but it's, this is what shook me very much, so that you will not say now that I'm playing uh, orient, uh, sorry, orientalist anti-orient cards. No, the West is the same shit. Can I advise you, maybe you know it, I'm sorry if I repeat myself, to read a book. I write about it in my old books, I think in Metastasis on Enjoyment, which you don't know, <laughs> so I can repeat myself. Read Aldous Huxley, whom I otherwise don't like too much, uh, Grey Eminence. The, it's the story of Père Joseph. He is probably, to be stupid, the cause of Hitler. In what sense? He was the uh, assistant <laughs> of Cardinal Richelieu, the big manipulator of France, during that, you remember, 30 years war between Protestants and Catholics in Europe, 1618-1648. Okay, this Père Joseph was the most disgusting manipulator you can imagine. He was ordering, you know, torture, poison, even, you know what he did? Because he knew, got it very well, that the true problem is not Catholicism or Protestantism, screw it. The true problem is to prevent Germany from becoming unified so that France will remain the central power. So what he did, Joseph, is, in a totally unprincipled way, in a war of Catholics against Protestants, he made a deal with Swedish Protestants, Lutherans, against the Austrian Catholics. And he succeeded. Germany was not unified. And as we all know, this delay is the ultimate cause for the First World War and then for the Second. So in this crazy, exaggerated logic, if you look at the symbolic point where European history went wrong to enable Buddhism, it's there. You know. Okay, now comes the shock, and that's what traumatized so much all those facts. At the same time, this same Per Joseph wrote in the evening after his usual work of torturing, betraying, poisoning, plotting was done, he wrote mystical meditations of absolute, if I may put it in these cheap consumerist terms, of the top heat quality, you know, like at the level of, I don't know, John of Cross, St. Teresa, or whatever. And this is what was so terrifying to accept for Huxley. I mean, no way to sidestep it. These are absolutely authentic spiritual meditation, meditations. Nonetheless, this guy was doing horrible things. Psychotic. Sorry? Psychotic. Yeah, but if you do it like this, then there are, in a way, yes, but uh, why? I still think that there are too many psychotics. Let me tell you another story which deeply, which, okay, maybe there are, yes. Although, you know that, you are right, you know that Lacan says that being normal is a special type of Psychotic, you know, or ever. Okay, but what I want to say is that, uh, you know, when I read books about history of Nazism and so on, I was also always disturbed by this figure of, you know, the really bad guy, Reinhard Heydrich, you know, the one who organized a certain conference, you know, that, uh, how do you call it, the, the Holocaust. How do you call it? Uh, you know, Wanzel, yeah, who organized the Wanzel conference. 
But you know what's again so troubling? You know that this same guy organizing Holocaust, blah, blah, he was an excellent violin player. And in the evenings, he met with his close uh, SS friends and they played, uh, it's the top of the music, my God, Beethoven's late string quartets. I mean, isn't there something ethically so scandalous and unjust? <laughs> How can such a terrifying person, you know, didn't he see the contradiction? Here I defend Lenin, because enemies of Lenin claim this is Lenin's brutality. You know, it's a well-known anecdote. Once Lenin uh, was staying with a friend illegally there, hidden with a friend, was a bourgeois family, they had a piano, and another guy, guest there, played Beethoven's Appassionata and so on. And Lenin started to cry, you know. He said, this is so beautiful. But then Lenin said, but wait a minute. I must not get caught into it. No, if I listen to this too much, instead of killing my enemies, I will start to tap them on their shoulders, you know. <laughs> and people say, you see how brutal Lenin was. Oh, I prefer Lenin to Heidrich. Because Lenin at least saw the tension, you know. The horror is when you don't see the tension. The horror is when you play a passionata or late quartet and still go on killing and so on, you know. So, again, uh, I think that uh, here I, I am for the Jewish Christian option, which is precisely to admit the gap. I think that in the religion, and here I praise all three religions of the book, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. You know that uh, one of the most beautiful thing in traditional Islam, they are right, is when Mohammed says, you have to follow rituals. If you really believe in me or not, that's your problem. Nobody... You know, this idea that uh, you admit a gap between social morality and your inner life and so on. You don't try to, to bring them together, as it were. Okay, I will go on with this just for five, ten minutes, and then you will get your yes, please, because the lady is there, and she will start to whip me if I... So in the latest uh, Big Fat book, you say there's three ethical positions that the hedonist, the immoralist, which is vis-a-vis -vis Lacan's ethics of Jerusalem, yeah. and Western Buddhists. So if, if the Judeo-Christian Islamic mm -hmm. legacy should be preserved, do you place it categorically within the immoralist? No, 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 no. So why is it not a fourth? Which is which? Are, why I, is it not a fourth? I, I, I would have to look at it. I forgot what I said there. I admit it. You know, when you have a book of thousand pages, when you start, when you end writing it, you forgot what you said at the beginning. Sorry. No, but what I want to say is, uh, 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 how should I put it? Is that uh, what I like? Uh, yes, yes, in Islam. Yes, you know. Uh, I am always, this is why I am afraid of Gnosticism and this orientation which dismiss all too easily, oh, these are just external rituals, what matters is your inner sincere belief. No, if you want authentic morality, you should be for surface. You should say, you know, like, I don't care what is your shitty inner experience, help that lady, help that boy help those people, and I don't care if you do it for pathological reasons. You know, like, you must accept this gap. You know, you don't play the game like, uh, you did it right, but for the wrong reasons. You know, I don't care about reasons. Do the right thing. This is why I quote in another of my books. This is for me practical Western ethics, ethics best. Uh, uh, I read somewhere and then I will, sorry, two minutes. I mean, uh, a wonderful story, maybe you know it, I repeat it often, about South Africa, where a lady, no, there were in apartheid times demonstrations, police was trying to break it, beating, and what happened was that a white policeman, guy, was chasing, pushing away a black lady, running after her with the how you call this stick? Oh. Sorry? No. Cla yeah, yeah. And then something, th this is a legend there, they told me, my friends, something very mysterious happened. 
You know the situation. It was not a crowd. The crowd was just dispersing policemen running after a black lady. The lady had shoes, probably she was not so poor, already the, white, the black bourgeoisie, with high heels. So running away, she lost one of her uh, shoes. And then, this wasn't inner goodness. This was this automatic superficial manners. You know, he was raised like this, superficially. The policeman did what you automatically do in a totally superficial way. He picked up the shoe and gave it to the lady and said, here, lady, and then come the wonder. Then they looked at each other and they felt you like, should we say, now you have the shoe, now let's do it again? <laughs> but you know what's crucial here, I claim? It's totally wrong to read this as his inner goodness took over. No, deep in his psyche, he was probably a shitty racist, whatever. But you know, the goodness exploded through totally external manners. You know, which is another example here. I quoted every good literary... Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm closing it out, so. Every good uh, literary style will tell you. The most touching, wonderful moment in Huck Finn, I think, when, you know, there is an escaped slave, and Huck helps him. But he feels guilty. He helps him out of superficial politeness, but he feels guilty, am I doing the right thing? You know, how, how should I put it, ethics is on the side of superficial morale. When he starts to think deeply, he is disgusted at, at what he did. I like very much this logic. I, uh, this is uh, where I even, against certain superficial psychoanalysis, I don't like this, oh, let me look deep into you. I claim, I'm kind of a conservative theologist here, if we look deep into ourselves, we discover shit. Let's stay at the surface. I'm sorry, ladies.